I'm your host, Lori Creever. This program, we're joined by Ginger Applegarth, author of Wake Up and Smell the Money. To wake up and smell the money means you experience your money. You've, it becomes real to you. If you walk into a store with a credit card, studies show this over and over again, and it's always the same percentage, which I think is really interesting. You know, over the years, it's always been one third more. If you walk into a store with a credit card, you will spend one third more than if you walk into a store with cash. With cash. Right. Ooh. But with where your money for a week, you take your paycheck and you cash it. Uh -huh. Okay. So that, that number printed on the paycheck becomes real to you. Or if you have it electronically deposited, mm -hmm. you write yourself a check for ca cash. You take that amount of cash out. If you're not working, just write a check for a couple of weeks worth of expenses. Take that cash and wear it on your body for a week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. Usually people use money belts. I had one client who used saran wrap and duct tape. <laughs> and that was very painful because every time she went to spend money, she had to rip that duct tape off. <laughs> but the idea is that as you spend, you have to take the money out from what you're wearing. Ah, and, and then you spending. see it decreasing. You see it decreasing. You feel it decreasing. And you it's are, going away. And you're really worried that you're going to run out of money. <laughs> yeah. Because God. you've made a commitment that at least for these two weeks, you're not going to use your credit card or your debit card. Mm -hmm. And people have said to me, I can't do that. What happens if I get mugged? And I said, well, look, if you get mugged, at least you can blame somebody else for the fact you won't have the money in 10 years. But if you keep spending the way you are, you're not going to have it anyway, and you can only blame <laughs> yourself. yourself. So take a chance. See what it's like. And mm -hmm. this, it, it's amazing to me. It's just instant change. Wow. Because we, we're connecting with our money. And I know that sounds really... Um, Pollyannish, but it works. Yeah, I mean, right. I, and yeah. a lot of these things, a lot of the strategies I have in the book, I learn from clients. You know, I'm not a genius, but I work, I work with clients who are both very wealthy and are middle income. And frankly, the middle income clients teach me a lot more than the very wealthy clients do, because they're the ones who are coming up with all the ways that they can meet their goals on right. a limited income. Right, right, because they've got some uh, more boundaries, right. barriers that they're looking at, so they've got to be more flexible and creative. That was something um, that was very interesting and surprising to me in the book was, you know, I always assume that people that make good money are managing it brilliantly and just have, <laughs> have know. hundreds of thousands of dollars in their retirement account and all of their kids' college is pretty much paid for by the time they hit kindergarten. And yet, in your book and in your experience as a financial planner, no, this is not necessarily true? That's right. And that's why in the, 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 at the very beginning of the book, in the beginnings chapter, I have those charts that show you, so you can kind of compare yourself with other Americans. I'm trying to get rid of this myth that the wealthy are in better financial shape. Because mm -hmm. remember, they just have higher... They just have higher standards of living. They have right. greater expectations. Mm -hmm. They run with another crowd that, is, mm -hmm. that makes them, that's a lot more expensive. Yes. But at the beginning of the book, I have charts to show you how Americans, what they own and the different things they own, like how much is the average house, how much is, how much are cars, how much in different, how much in retirement accounts, what they own, mortgages, car loans, credit cards, et cetera, mm -hmm. what they're spending and what they're spending it on, like how much they're spending on food, what percentage of their mm -hmm. income, et cetera and how much they're saving based on income and based on age. So you can take those charts and quickly look and see, all right, here's somebody my age, this is what their financial situation looks like, mm -hmm. and then here's somebody with my income, here's, what, here's how they're handling their money, and it gives you a, a bit of a comparison so that you don't walk around feeling like everybody else is in better financial shape. Right. Right. If you're just joining us right now, we are at the Garden Gate Bed and Breakfast in St. Paul at Goodrich and Milton. And we're talking with Ginger Applegarth, who is a financial planner. She's the author of The Money Diet and also Wake Up and Smell the Money. I'm curious, for the typical person, the kid in all of us, do you think it's possible for people to completely manage their finances on their own, or do you recommend that people do work with a financial planner or accountant, let's say even quarterly? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in terms of um, being held accountable. Like right. we already talked about how, how people know what the right thing is, but um, is it enough like between you and your spouse to stick to your plan, or do you think people are more successful when they've got an outside, you know, like a third party helping them to attain their goals and consulting with them regularly. Right. I think everyone can use 
a financial planner at some point in their lives, preferably as early as possible, because again, a financial planner can help you quantify the future so that it seems real. Uh, we have a great uh, psychological uh, phenomenon here in the United States called temporal myopia, which is, ba which is really the inability to see the future. Yeah. You know, instant gratification, we're living in the moment because we're being bombarded all around by, you know, it's not just spin this, spin this, spin this, but it's also, you know, do day trading, buy this stock, buy this mutual fund, buy this bond. It's, it's information overload. Mm -hmm. Many people are helped by going to a financial planner once or twice just so they get a big picture. We're so grounded in the day-to-day, -day, like the money that's in the checking account that we don't see the big picture. And the big picture includes things like, do I have enough automobile insurance? Do I have enough uh, life insurance? Do I have enough disability insurance? Yeah. And of course, I'm a great fan of disability insurance since I can't get it. But if you uh -huh. think about it, disability insurance, your income producing ability is your most valuable asset. Just look at how much you're yeah. making now and multiply it by the number of years you have until you retire. Not even counting any raises. Right. You're worth a lot, as we say, on the hoof. <laughs> Um, right, yes. But yes. there are also a lot of ways that people can do financial planning on their own. And in Wake Up and Smell the Money, I have chart, very easy charts. I'm, I'm a great believer in making things as easy as possible. There's yes. no reason to make it more complicated. Uh, it just is intimidating. You can use the charts to make your own financial plan. There are also, because of the internet, there's so many uh, options in terms of information. For example, I write for a website, moneycentral.com, which is the old Microsoft investor. And they have uh, five or six different experts, and we each write in different areas. They have user groups where you can post your questions. You can do research on 16,000 different investments wow. so that you can do it on your own. And they also have terrific software. Quicken has Quicken Financial Planner, Microsoft mm -hmm. Money 99, where you, you know, it takes a couple of hours to put your data in. You get a complete financial plan. Mm -hmm. with, with a year-by-year -year look at, snapshot of your income, your projected income and expenses and savings and what your investments are going to be all the way from now until whenever you put in the computer that you expect to die. Hmm. And it's terrific. These are terrific because you get printouts, you can, uh, it, it's very motivational. Now, sometimes it does take that outside person. If someone comes to yeah. me and they have, they're really having trouble with spending, yeah. We set them up on Microsoft Money 99, and then we teach them how to use it. We do their, you know, we set it up so they can do online banking and everything, and then mm -hmm. they have to come back in two months and show mm -hmm. me their printouts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people need that outside. It's like setting a deadline. Yes. We all, for some reason, we think that we come last. <laughs> people say to me, I'm so busy with work, I don't have time to deal with my money. Well, you know what? Your company is not going to bail you out when you're 70. Right. or bail you out when it's time for the kids to go to school. Right. You've got to put yourself first. That's not being selfish, it's being smart. Yes, yes. Now let's talk about, let's talk about some other unpleasant things, things that are hard for people to look at. Okay. And that is um, the subject of divorce. A yeah. lot of people go to mediation now, and if you are um, maybe a woman who has stayed at home, and the husband has built up a pension fund or 401k plan. What are some tips for anybody out there that's going through a divorce in terms of handling and managing their finances so that they've got somewhat of a secure future and also right. for their children and the alimony, child support, all of that? Well, the smartest thing to do, and, and there is a whole section in the book on fresh starts, which yeah. is divorce, death, changing jobs, losing a job, changing careers, starting a business, because these are the things that happen as we, as we proceed through life. You have to know what your financial situation is. So get Many your head out of the sand. Twenty-eight percent of spouses do not know how much the other spouse makes. Twenty-eight oh. oh. percent, and it is not. We, we think, oh well, it's just got to be people who never who are, had any college, right, or, who aren't educated. Who are, no, no. I, I gave a speech a few years ago at a national banking conference, and it was for women. Now, most of the people in the audience were spouses, but there were also f some female bankers there mm -hmm. as well. And a woman came up to me afterward and said, I really, you know, after listening to you, I really think I probably need to know something about my finances. I have no idea how much we make. Uh, my husband's the president of a bank. Uh, he has, he keeps everything in a locked drawer at work and he keeps saying, don't you trust me? I'll take care of everything. I'll take care of everything. And he just gives me an allowance. And I said, well, what about the tax return? Do you, don't, don't you look at that? And she said, no, 
He puts his hand over it so I can't see it, and I just uh, sign on the bottom because he doesn't want me to worry. Oh my gosh! And I thought, all right, worry about this what? This is a very unsophisticated person. And so, and, she's and a I'm very really, I'm really controlling, um, right? I, spouse. I, I thought she's really intimidated. So I said, well, she said I'm very intimidated. And I said, well, maybe a few sessions with a counselor would be helpful. I didn't want to use the word therapist. Right. But very often, actually, therapists can be helpful because if you're having problems with money in a marriage, it is a symptom of something else. Absolutely. Absolutely a symptom yeah. of something else. And she looked at me. And she was absolutely shocked. And she said, I'm a therapist. I'm a psychologist. I do marriage counseling. <gasps> from an Ivy League school. So <laughs> oh my gosh. In whatever situation you're in, there's somebody else with more education who, who is making worse mistakes than you are. <laughs> if you're going through a divorce, you have to know what the assets are. Now, by law, your spouse is supposed to be, have full disclosure. Yes. But I have a checklist of things you need to know, but you need to know what the assets are. You need to get copies of the tax returns for the last five years at least. Mm -hmm. You need to get written verification of who's the beneficiary on the life insurance, on the retirement plans, yes. uh, on all of those things. You need to know how assets are hold, held. Many people don't know whether the house is partly in their name or partly in their spouse's name. Mm -hmm. Mediation is a great thing because it really cuts down on legal fees, yeah. but you have to be smart if you're going to go through mediation, which means you need to have all this information. Yeah, you need to be empowered right. already. And frankly, if you if you wait until you're going through a divorce to get this information, it's going to be a lot more expensive because your spouse may be dragging his or her feet, mm -hmm. and you've got to get the lawyers involved to get the information, and it's just a huge mess. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to remember is, is I've had pe people, come, men and women, come to me whose financial lives have been absolutely decimated by divorce. Yes. And they have been able to make the change. They've been able to turn their lives around. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about credit cards? Credit card, I'm not one of these people who say that credit cards are all evil and you should cut them all up. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it would be great in theory, but doesn't work in the real world. You have to have a credit card if you're going to rent a car, I mean, you cannot run a car without reserve a credit card. Reserve an airline ticket. Do it uh, by an airline ticket, buy something on the internet, reserve a hotel room, buy tickets over the phone, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you can pay those off as soon as possible, month mm -hmm. to month. And let me give you an example of why you want to pay them off as soon as possible. And that's because at 20% interest rate, let's say you have a $1,500 credit card balance, mm -hmm. at a 20% interest rate, you are still paying for the dinner you put on the credit card last night, 20 years from now. And if you have $1,500 balance and you're paying it off minimum payments, you pay almost $4,000 of interest over those 20 years. And that's another interest. chart I have. In addition, I also have charts that, that show you, because investing is a big issue now, yeah. exactly what percentage of your investments should be in different kinds of investments, mm -hmm. as well as uh, helping you figure out which mutual fund is right for you. Mm -hmm all based on when your goals, when you expect to need that money for your goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is such a good book. It's so Thank comprehensive, you. truly. There is something in this book literally for everyone, as Ginger has been telling us, fresh starts for any season of your life, no matter if you just won the lottery or if you've gone through a loss, death of a parent or spouse, you need to get smart about your finances. And uh, I highly recommend the book. Thanks. It's great. By the way, did you know we talked about how we think everybody else is happier than we are? Yes. The majority of lottery winners wish they had never won. Oh. Because it changes their life so irre irreparably. Oh, how interesting. So be happy that you didn't win the lottery. Be happy that you have to work <laughs> still and you have a purpose and you have to get out of bed in the morning. You need right. to be somewhere. Um, thank you for joining us for 30 Minutes with the Author. I'm your host, Lori Creever, reminding you to read a book. It could change your life. And let's encourage our children to do the same. Until next time, goodbye.